The book of Revelation, chapter 2. Revelation, chapter 2. We're getting into the third of seven churches of the book of Revelation. And as you know, and I will reiterate, I told you I would, that Jesus appears to the Apostle John in what we would call chapter 1. But please keep in mind that which I have repeatedly said and will repeatedly say, that chapter breaks in the Bible often really ruin the context. God didn't put them there. Men did. And when you read from chapter 1 into chapter 2, you would say, well, now he starts the letters. Who starts the letters? It's not just gentle Jesus, meek and mild, wearing a linen tunic and having dark brown hair and, and looking very Middle Eastern, which is what he did. But it's Jesus now resurrected, glorified, exalted in heaven with hair white as wool, face shining like the sun, eyes piercing through all that blinding brightness that pierced the soul and heart. A robe that reaches down to his feet with a golden sash across his chest, which means royalty and priesthood. His feet glowing like bronze in a furnace. And in his right hand, seven stars, the seven angels of the churches that are going to be addressed in this book. And he's walking amidst seven golden lampstands, which are there in heaven. So this is an imagery that's being given that the Churches, all his churches, are in his presence, as it were. He sees them for what they are. Are they giving off light? Are they truly a light to the world? That's why they're lampstands and little lamps that are on them. Little, you know, in, in the world, it would be little clay lamps about this size. If you want to see one, there's one up here on the communion table afterwards. Come and take a look. It's not an original. It's a reproduction. But, but it, they're little tiny things, and they're filled with olive oil, but they put out a lot of light. And we're supposed to be that in this world. The world's a dark place. One little lamp, one match lit in a dark room lights up the whole room. But a church that's not burning, a church that doesn't have that light going on, doesn't have oil in the reservoir, symbol of the Holy Spirit used continuously in the Bible for such things. That church, Jesus said, is in danger of me removing that lamp, pulling the lamp stand out completely. You may continue to function as an organization, but you don't belong to me. And he has nothing to do with such churches. That's severe admonishment, especially from the one who has hair white as snow, face shining like the sun, eyes of flame and fire, warp white robe down to his ankles, a golden sash across his chest, feet burning like bronze in the fire, the judgment. And he holds those seven angels of the churches, whatever that is, whether they're leaders, literal angels, uh, uh, bishops, as it were. Again, I've defined that term last time. Don't be afraid of that term. <clears throat> whatever it is. But we know that they have influence and a message to the churches. And that person starts speaking to the churches and he tells John write this down and John writes it down and as he does so he begins now to write the words of Jesus people say Jesus never wrote any letters in the Bible or any part of the Bible of course he did this is it he dictated it well that's not the same thing then you need to dispose of probably most of the New Testament because most of the New Testament was dictated to a scribe, different scribes, who wrote things down. So this is what you have in the Bible. Jesus is dictating a letter. Seven letters. And the third letter, after Ephesus, which had left its first love, Smyrna, which was in big trouble, because not because of being bad, but because of being good, now he writes to one that's sort of in the middle, a church that has been both troubled and also very pleasing to him in certain ways, and also in some rather frightening ways. It's the church of Pergamum. Now, Pergamum is a city in the... Oops, let me back up here. It's a city in Turkey. Just got back from that trip a week and a half ago, a little less than that, but through Asia Minor and Greece. If you don't know where the seven churches are, you can see them barely on this map. Turkey is a very big place. Asia Minor, 
To the left of the, off the screen is Greece. That's the uh, Aegean Sea right there. Uh, to the north is the Black Sea. You can see that sticking down there. North of the Black Sea, along the northern rim of the Black Sea, is Ukraine. That's in the news a lot, so kind of you get your bearings there. Just off the screen where the water goes to the south on the right-hand side, go below there, you got Lebanon, and then you have Israel below that. So if you're not into geography, maybe that'll help orient you. But on this particular map that you see behind me, you have a lot of different places represented there across the map. And I'm going to turn around here for just a second. So you have places like Iconium and Lystra, Pisidian Antioch. We've talked about these places, especially in the book of Acts. Tarsus, where Saul of Tarsus is from. And there's Antioch, where the mission center of the church was. Cappadocia up there, which is mentioned twice in the New Testament. Very important places. Way up in the corner, Troas, Asos, Troy with Trojan War. And up here, Istanbul, way up in the corner, which was not Istanbul back then. It was Byzantium. But you see these red markers here. And you have Laodicea, Ephesus, Smyrna, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, all of these places right in here. You've got the seven churches. Those are the ones marked in red. John evidently had something to do with overseeing these churches, as I've already mentioned, those in particular. But there were churches in all of these locations and more. Now, Pergamum was quite a place. This is, uh, I don't think I'm working here. Am I doing it? Nope. Can you advance me there? There we go. Uh, somebody put a, a graphic together on what they thought Pergamum's Acropolis looked like. Pergamum was a big, big city. As a matter of fact, it was the most important city in that entire region. And it was also a center, I'll mention this again, <clears throat> of Caesar worship. In fact, when Augustus died and one of his officials had a vision said, I saw Augustus' soul ascending to heaven to be among the gods. Caesar worship suddenly came into its own. As I mentioned before, and we've got to talk about this a lot because it shows up almost all the way through the book of Revelation in places because the people understood it. And Jesus likened it to a lot of different things, including something that those of you that have been around a while here know as the abomination that causes desolation? What does that have to do with Caesar worship? Everything. The mark of the beast, what does that have to do with Caesar worship? Everything. As you'll see, when we, especially when we get into chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. That's going to be a while, but when we get there, it just flies open. Caesar worship was first adopted in Pergamum. And Pergamum was an important Greek city that then became Roman. And in Pergamum... You have this huge theater built on the side of a hill. That hill is only the top part of the hill in this graphic. That hill is actually 1,200 feet above the plain below it. It's a huge Acropolis. And up there were all kinds of temples. And just above the theater, you can see perhaps a very large building set kind of up on the crest of the hill to slightly to the right. That's the Library of Pergamum. The Library of Pergamum ranked with the Library of Alexander and the Library of Celsus, Alexandria rather, and the Library of Celsus, the great libraries of the world, three of them. And one of them was in Pergamum. It's completely gone now. Pergamum was famous for something that you know very well, parchment. Papyrus came out of Egypt. Parchment came out of Pergamum, which is why they invented it and scrolls tended to last so long because Pyrus breaks down, but not parchment, not easily. And it came from there. It was a huge pagan center. And once again, it specialized in Caesar worship. This is a little bit closer look at it here, of the, the Acropolis only of Pergamum. It was a big, big place. This is a sort of a model of what the whole city looked like. You can see the Acropolis there towards the top and the city splaying out down the sides of this hill down into the plain. If you wanted to walk from the bottom to the top, again, 1,200 vertical feet to get up there. It's a big, steep place. And it was really the capital of the region protected by a disposable city, which we'll talk about next time. A disposable city. What do I mean by that? Like an Alamo. Remember, the Alamo was fought only to slow down Santa Ana's army so that Houston could build his own army to be able to take on Santa Ana's army. Thyatira 
existed about 30 miles away from this one, only to slow down an invading army. It was there to be destroyed if necessary, so it would save this city. This city was that important. This is what it looks like today. That's the Acropolis, and you can see the theater. The angle of that theater is the steepest Greek Roman theater, Greek originally, Roman later. There's a way to identify that. I don't have to get into all of that today. But steepest one in the empire. Absolutely spectacular location up there. You can see to the left, there's a big area up there with a big tree in the middle of it. That area happens to be a place where there was a pagan temple to the god, Emperor Trajan. Now that guy came along after 100 AD, actually quite substantially after, but he was also worshipped as a god. Here's another view of it. This is Angle looking down. You can see how steep the theater is, and that's modern Berga, the Turkish city at the foot of the, of the Acropolis down there. It's a huge city down there, and they make great kebabs, by the way. If you ever come along, we'll turn you on to that. But this is another view of it looking the other direction. You can see the mountains, and it's got a, a, you know, huge canyons on either side. We know about canyons, but you can see the top of the theater there and the ruins of some of the temples above. Then this site... Now, I'm going to show you this because I have to refer to this in a minute. But you can see in front there are obviously ruins in front. But look at the trees in the background. The trees in the background surround a small mound. The trees are recent, very recent. They're not ancient. They're just Roman pines. But they're built on a site that used to have, so there's the site there. Again, nothing to see. But up until the German archaeologists came in and, well, I'm sorry to say, raided the site, that stood there. That's now in Berlin. And that's called the Altar to Zeus. The Altar to Zeus was a massive pagan altar that was there on the hill. It was really the main god of the Pergamese. Is that the right word to call them? The, the, the Pergamites? Uh, the Pergamim? I don't know. Something. Anyway. But the main god was Zeus, and that was the altar to Zeus. And it's a world-famous thing, and you can visit it in the museum in Berlin. I've never been there, but I, I had to steal the picture somewhere. And this is the motif going around it. This is one of the friezes, as they call it. It's not, you know, it's, it's sort of a three-dimensional picture as opposed to freestanding sculpture. And what you're seeing is a conflict that goes all the way around, a fight of the gods and demigods and all of these type of things against each other and Zeus and what have you. And one of the things you'll notice is that guy kind of off to the right who's falling down. If you look at where his leg should be, what do you see? It's a snake. He's turning into, people are in this freeze are turning into snakes. So it's, that's an important detail. And once again, I'm going to mention that in just a minute. And then there's this. This is a fascinating little place. It's up there in that big open area I showed you. This is the tree. And that little circular area right there is another altar to another pagan god. Now, I don't want this to turn into an academic lecture. I just want you to be oriented. When I start talking about this letter, you'll be able to picture these things in your head. But this is the altar to the god, the divine Augustus Caesar. Another Caesar worship altar. And this happens to be the first altar, the first temple to any divine or god Caesar anywhere in Asia Minor. This is it right here. So this is Pergamum. I'll just leave this pretty picture up for you to kind of just peruse because that's what it looks like today. Those beautiful white columns that are standing there, you're talking about 40 to 50 feet tall. They're gigantic. And the front there used to be on top. Now it's down below, but it fell down in an earthquake sometime. And the archaeologists put all of what you see back up because it was in deplorable condition when they found it. But that's the temple to the divine emperor Trajan. I say these things very tongue-in-cheek because I don't believe in the divinity of emperors. As you know, you know me well. But I wanted to let you know about the Caesar worship that went on there for an extremely important reason because it enlightens what's going on in this letter and it brings home the message not just to the Pergamese people, to us. 
because all seven of these letters are written to seven different churches that constitute any particular problem that could arise in any particular church. It's a limited number of issues, but they're issues that can afflict churches in the long term. We have short-term problems in churches, and we see them as massive problems. Somebody gets angry with somebody else, and we have to work out some sort of peace between two people. Well, that's why God gave us communion, you know. Remember that one. But you know that there are all kinds of issues that can affect a church. Jesus is talking about things that seep into the church, like an incoming tide that's a red tide, it's poison. And it can happen in any sense. And what happens to the people in Ephesus? They left their first love, but it didn't happen overnight. The people in Smyrna, well, their problem grew gradually too because people learned they wouldn't cooperate with Caesar worship. And they got persecuted for it, as we talked about last time. And then you have the people in Pergamum. And they got into the situation. They did very gradually. It's like Satan flew in under the radar very slowly in a blimp or something. You know, just, just very slowly moved in and, and then had this massive effect in the church, but not all at once. And the same thing happens with Thyatira and Sardis. Philadelphia, not so much. We'll talk about them when we get there. Of course, their problem was completely different. And Laodicea, they didn't get lukewarm overnight either. They had to cool down. Well... Let's read the letter. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, This is, remember, Jesus exalted, glorified. Can you see him? The description that John gave, can you see him? And he's saying this to John. Write this down. Here's his words. He wrote a letter, seven of them. These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Remember, John's vision of Jesus, all glorified and exalted, also included one other detail. A sharp, double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Obviously, this is imagery. This is like, like a, a parable or hyperbole, if you want to call it. But it's a way of saying, when he speaks, it's the word of God. This is God speaking. This is not a good moral teacher or a great man who walked the earth who is now exalted by God. This is the Son of God. God exalted. God in human form now raised and exalted. This is Jesus who is not just divine. He is God. Caesar's could be declared divine. Jesus is God. This is so important to remember. There's a gigantic extinction, uh, distinction between the two. Extinction between the two. Wow, that's weird. Okay, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Jesus says to the Pergamese, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. Where Satan has his throne, where Satan has his throne, well, what would that be? Would that be this? Would that be this? I mean, Paul makes it very clear when he's talking in one of his letters that whoever worships an idol worships a demon. Could this be it? I mean, this is the, th this is the altar of Zeus. This is the big one for the region where Satan has his throne. Plus, of course, you have the, 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 the gods or the, these demigods or whatever turning into snakes and serpents. Plus... There's another thing happening in Pergamum, which I didn't have any pictures of to show you this morning, but it happens to be way down below uh, at the foot of the mountain and set apart from it, a temple of a god known as Asclepius. What do you care? Every time you go to a doctor, you see his image. Every single time. It's the snake on the pole for medicine. No, that's not the snake on the pole from the Torah, where, you know, the snakes are infesting the camp, and every time they bite somebody, somebody's going to die. And so Moses is told by God, put a bronze snake on a pole, and all people have to do to be cured if they get bit is look at the snake. Just look at it. You'll be cured. Snake on a pole. That is not what you're seeing in a medical 
office. Those of you that are into, you know, you might be a, a doctor or a nurse or a physician's assistant or whatever you are, you know as well as I do that the Hippocratic Oath that doctors swear is by Asclepios. Now, that doesn't make doctors bad. Don't do that. It's a tradition. All right. Would I have a problem with it? I think I would. But the bottom line is it is a tradition. Just remember, it's a tradition. But that's where it came from. And the temple of Asclepios is at the bottom of the hill. And Asclepios is a snake god who heals. I mean, the snakes up here don't exactly heal. <laughs> Rattlesnakes and things like that. But, they, but what you would do is you would go to the temple of Asclepios, you'd do your sacrifice, and you'd lay down in these long tunnels that they had there. And big, big tunnels they had underground, and they'd have snakes in them. They weren't poisonous. But if a snake rubbed up against you, then that was good luck from the gods, and you're going to be healed. This is what they would say. I don't know about you, but that would not be my favorite place to want to get healed. And uh, not exactly a good hospital. But that may, may, is that about Satan? Satan, remember? That serpent, he's even called that old serpent in the book of Revelation. And, of course, we know that from Genesis, that he's the serpent, you know, in the, in the garden. There's this Satan, is, he appears as a serpent. So, does this mean this is Satan's throne? It could be. It very well could be. However, there are other possibilities. Don't forget <clears throat> that Satan means, you should know this by now, his name means what? What is it? Deceiver, Deceiver accuser. Don't forget that. He is an accuser. And in our case, the accuser. Satan accuses. The Christians living in a Caesar-worshipping environment, much less a major pagan environment, which Pergamum was, along with all these major cities in that area, they're not going to be worshipping pagan gods, and they certainly aren't going to burn that pinch of incense to Caesar once a year and say, Caesar is Lord, because they know Jesus is Lord. And that means that, number one, if Caesar isn't your lord, you're disloyal to the empire. Number two, you're a traitor. Number three, you're not worshiping the god the way the god insists that you worship him, and therefore he might inflict his wrath upon the people. Plagues, fire, floods, famines. We, we've repeated this many times, you know. And so, if anything goes wrong, you're to blame. That's it. You're the problem. And if you're to blame, they're going to treat you like it. And that's a bad thing because in that world, life was not valued in the same way that we value life in our world as little value as sometimes we can say our world has right now. It was far worse back then. And these people, they were under duress and Jesus compliments them for it. He tells them, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. The accuser has his throne. What are they being accused of? They're not being deceived, not yet, not in that manner. There's something else going on here too. What are they being accused of? Not worshiping Caesar, not worshiping the God, not worshiping the gods. And bringing problems down on people or setting them up for problems and earthquakes and terrible things to happen. Because they're not worshiping the gods and they're being accused of it. Where Satan has his throne can be a reference to those temples, to the altar of Zeus, to the temple of, of uh, Augustus, where Trajan wasn't there at the time, he came later. Or it could be that where the accuser has his throne. You have done the right thing. You have been accused of doing the wrong things. And the devil is most certainly behind it. Absolutely. Where Satan has his throne. And Jesus brings that up. He said, yet, you have letter half of verse 13, you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. My faithful witness 
Uh, by the way, witness there means uh, martyr. Martyr means witness. Yeah, witness. Witnesses often who stand for what they have seen and heard. Remember Peter and John. We can't help proclaiming what that which we have seen and heard when they stood in front of the deadliest group of men in Jerusalem at the time, the Sanhedrin. And they wanted them dead. So we can't stop. Why? They were martyrs. No, they weren't going to be put to death at that time. It was going to be a long time later when that happened. But they were still witnesses because they just they can't back away from the truth. How do you know that Jesus was real? I was talking to Wes about that this morning. We had a good conversation. There's so many people that say that Jesus never existed. Yeah, you didn't know it was going to make it into the sermon, did you? It's okay. That's all right. It's a very good thing, isn't it? But people say that Jesus never existed. Then how do you explain his apostles? That every last one of them, except for John, died a martyr's death with on their lips. I saw him. I can't lie about it. He was alive. I touched him. He was there. He rose up into heaven. I was there when it happened. You say, well, John, he died of old age. Yes, but apparently there was a, a, a martyrdom attempt on his life where he was boiled in oil and survived it. So he was sent to Patmos instead. Church tradition, maybe some truth to it. Probably some form of truth attached to it because we don't have exact details on it. All we know is that something terrible must have happened to John, and he survived. And yet none of these men would recant anything. It would be so easy just to simply say, I, I was kidding. Don't, don't cut me to pieces. I was kidding. Don't skin me alive. I was just kidding. Uh, no, it's not real. Well, that, that's my interpretation. Or worse yet, that's my truth. That phrase is an abomination as far as I'm concerned. The truth is the truth, and it doesn't become less true, and it can't become more true. It just is. We can put our opinions on it all we want to. It doesn't change the truth. Well, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You, you, you have stuck it through. You've had the pressure on. You wouldn't deny that I am the Messiah. You wouldn't deny, Jesus said, that I am who I said I am, that I am who I am. You wouldn't deny that. You did not renounce your faith in me. You didn't say, I was only kidding. Or, here, let me rephrase that. Or, let me frame it like it was my truth. Even in the days of Antipas. Why would he say that? Even in the days of Antipas, that means that that was a particularly bad time. Even in the days of Antipas, it seems to that persecution to the Pergamese had hit a peak right there. It was really, really scary for them. They were not only afraid for their lives, they were afraid of the death that they were offered and guaranteed if they didn't back down. And yet they didn't back down. Even in the days of Antipas, Jesus compliments him, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, that city, he was put to death. Who was this guy? We don't know. There are monuments around the world, but none probably more moving than the one that says in Arlington National Cemetery, here are recorded the names of Americans who gave their lives in the service of their country and who sleep in unknown graves. Their names known only to God. You're here today, as I said last week, because there are millions of names who history and records have never recorded, who also, like the Pergamese, would not renounce their faith in Jesus and went to some sort of death, a horrible death, quick, a lonely death, painful, whatever it might have been, excruciating, and yet still they said, Jesus, just take me, let's go. I say, man, that would be a way to go, but I don't want to do it, and neither do you. And we don't have the grace to do such a thing, I think, until something like that actually comes upon a person. But Antipas, as far as we can tell, there are certain inklings, threads of church tradition, some even threads of church history that suggest not who this man was, but how he died. 
And they think that he was roasted alive inside the belly of a bronze bull, where they sealed him up basically in a bronze statue of a bull and <laughs> slow roasted him. And it was a way that people used to kill people back in those days. It says there, there, nobody's ever found any evidence of a real bronze bull, but they found a lot of written evidence of things that happened to people in such a manner. I don't know about you, but I would not want to be slow roasted inside of a bronze bull. And Antipas apparently endured it. And all of these people were standing in line waiting to do the same thing. And Jesus said, you didn't even renounce me then. Now, what happened to the rest of those people? We don't know. But Antipas definitely made an impression on everyone. And he certainly, if you can put it this way, just let me put it in human terms, made an impression on Jesus. When people stand for their faith, sometimes it's only God who really knows it. But, as one person put it, the church was built with the mortar of their blood. That's leadership. They stood, they ran the race, and they finished well, and they finished with honor. Now, verse 14, Jesus says, but... Now, when that happens, prick your ears up. My Bible says, nevertheless. The short version is, but. To the contrary, in other words, I have a few things against you. He doesn't say, I have an itsy-bitsy problem with your doctrine. He says, I have a few things against you. Now, to us, reading it in English, it doesn't really have the slug to the head that it does with them. But if Jesus says to you, looking you in the eye, I have something against you, you better listen. You have people there. He's talking to the whole church. So some of the church is doing great. All of the church held on to Jesus. But there is a problem even though they didn't renounce the Lord. They stayed faithful to the Lord. They didn't renounce the Lord. They hung on to him, even in the days of Antipas. But you still, you have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrifice to idols, and by committing sexual immorality. And you have others who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Who are those guys? What's the deal with Balaam? And then he tells them this, Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now you think, well, that's kind of nice. At least he's not picking up a literal sword. Have you seen what happens at the end of the battle of Armageddon when Jesus opens his mouth? That's the end of the battle. All he says is, Something to the effect of, we're done here. It's done. The worst war that the world has ever seen, and it is over because of what he said. The word of God is more powerful than any nuclear exchange that could ever happen. Nothing comes close to the power of God speaking, especially when he, just with a word, spoke the entire universe into existence and he will speak it out of existence someday when we get to the book of Revelation more details on that the end of the book of Revelation so what's Jesus issue going on here well you've got first of all Balaam and Balaam is in the book of Numbers you can read about him there chapter 25 and chapter 31 and you have the Nicolaitans the pattern is about the same Two different groups of people. People that are following Balaam's teachings, maybe not even knowing it, but that's what they were doing. And people who called themselves the Nicolaitans. And they knew what they were doing. But the end result was basically the same. You see, they were blending paganism and Caesar worship and mixing it into the church. Someone 
Some people, maybe the entire rest of the population of Pergamum, outside the church, the threat was coming from the outside in. Uh, a reason, why do I say that? Because when we get to Thyatira next time, the threat comes from the inside out. That sounds very similar to what's going on, but the roles are reversed. It's very interesting. We'll get to that. But someone from the outside of the church, some group, the entire population, the community, the community itself was pressuring the Christians to, can't we just all get along, everyone? In the pagan world, can't we just, well, put, put the bumper sticker on your donkey or your chariot, coexist? <laughs> the problem is that that type of a thing is an accusation against Christians who are said, to, said not to coexist with anyone. I have news for you. In the Bible, they coexisted with everyone just fine. The problem is not everyone coexisted with them because Christians got in trouble not for what they did, for what they wouldn't do. I'll be your friend. I'll be your neighbor. I'll have business with you. I will talk with you. I will eat with you most of the time. But I'm not going to do what you do as far as worshiping other gods. I can't do that. I can't worship Caesar because there's only one Lord. Jesus is Lord. Everybody in that world had all these different religions. And here comes the Christians and they say, now just a second, Jesus is exclusive. And they didn't like that either. And I got news for you if you haven't figured it out. The world doesn't like it today either. Well, we have a plurality here, pluralism in our country. Anybody can worship whoever they want any way they want to. This is true. That's the law. I'm glad we have a law like that. It let's us sit here today and do what we're doing. But in those days, they had pluralism throughout the empire. But if you didn't worship Caesar, you were in trouble because that definitely was the national religion of the empire. And they wouldn't do it. And so they, in the minds of the people in Pergamum and everywhere else, were getting everyone else in trouble with the gods and with the empire because they wouldn't worship Caesar. This could have very, very bad connotations. Besides, in Pergamum, Pergamum was the capital of the region. The governor of the region lived there, and he alone had the power of the sword, the power of execution, to judge, to execute. Here's Jesus saying, I got the sword. Don't you worry about him. I've got the sword. So they held to the teaching of Balaam. You got some people there that hold to the teaching of Balaam. Well, who is Balaam? Now, most of you know, in a nutshell, Balaam was a prophet of God from Moab. He was not a Jew. He was, now this is a very weird thing. He was a pagan who represented God. I don't know how that worked. But in a place like Moab, I suppose anything goes. And yet, he claimed and was proven by God to be a prophet of God, even though he was an intensely devious, greedy, wicked man. And yet, when King Balak of the Moabites wanted him to pronounce a curse on the Israelites who were with Moses on the home stretch of their journey, going through their land, Balak wanted them dead. And he calls on Balaam to, in the name of the God of the Israelites, put a curse on all of those people. And so Balak, Balaam tried. Balak was going to pay him a lot of money. Balaam tried to curse them in the name of God, and all he could do was bless them. Four times he tried. And four times, every time he opened his mouth, he pronounced huge, marvelous, glowing, poetic, beautiful blessings on God's people. And when he was done, he was going, I can't believe I said that. That made him a real prophet, even though he was a really bad man. See, how could God do that? God can't do that. Yes, he can. He did. It's right there in the Bible. Take it. You don't have to analyze it. Just look at it. That's what happened. He even used a donkey to talk to Balaam. I think there was a message in that. But simply put, Balaam couldn't curse God's people. 
So he then suggested to Balak, I know how to get them. Send your sweet young virgins, your teenagers who are not married, just send them into the camp and have them seduce the men. Adultery, fornication. Strong words, biblical words. Seduce them. Because they're idol-worshipping pagans. Not the men, the ladies, these young ladies. They're raised in Moab. They worship idols. And part of their idol worship, and this is throughout the Bible, even into the New Testament, which is really kind of scary, weird stuff. Part of pagan worship, and you can bet the men invented this, was sexual immorality. You want to worship a god, then you go out and find yourself a virgin priestess and have sex with her. I'm sorry, this is a very PG-13 discussion, but that was the reality of the day, and that's how they worshipped and then she would introduce herself as representing this God, and she would also, you know, prepare food for him. So she would sacrifice the goat or the sheep or whatever it was to some pagan God and then serve the meat to the guy, and he would eat meat sacrificed to idols, knowing full well that it came from a sacrifice. This is what happened. Old Testament and New. Paul goes after this to the Corinthians. And it even happens here. And if you remember in the book of Acts, chapter 15, we go there so often. When the Gentiles start getting saved and the church wants to know, what do we do with these guys? Because they're not becoming Jews before they get saved to Jesus. And of course, they said, look, we'll, we'll meet and we'll talk about it. And they came back and wrote a letter to all the Gentiles. We said, no, you don't have to become a Jew before you become a Christian. It's okay. But stop eating meat sacrificed to idols, stop eating meat with the blood in it, stop drinking blood as a practice of worship, and stop committing sexual immorality. These are not Jewish kosher laws, even though they might be in there. They're in the laws of Moses for sure. They're saying stop being pagans. Stop acting like pagans. These sweet young things from Moab come back and they infiltrate the Israelites and the men who fall to this sexual prowess of them and what's going on, they start committing idolatry. And God causes a plague to break out among them that kills 24,000 of them in the camp. Simply put, Balaam was a corrupter. Balaam was a corrupter. He suggested ideas to the Moabite king Balak how to corrupt and thus destroy the Israelites. Again, if you want to read it, Numbers 25 and again Numbers 31. Balaam wasn't an Israelite. And he advised this pagan king how to bring down his perceived enemy. The Israelites were not threatening him, but they were threatening to him because there's a million, two million people that want to pass through his land with their flocks and herds. They'll defoliate the land. Moses said, that's not going to happen to you. You bless us, God will bless you. Balak disagreed. Balak said, you cross that line, we'll come after you. And that's when he called upon Balaam. Balaam led God's people into idolatry from the outside in. He wasn't one of them. He conspired with a pagan king to do certain things to bring them down. And in the process, it provoked God to take deadly action against his very own people, but in the end, especially against Balaam himself. He told Balak, here's how to get the people under your power. Seduce them into embracing your beliefs, your gods, your traditions. You'll neutralize them. And what happened? Got the people, to a certain extent, destroyed. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. What? is happening here. Now you know the story of Balaam. Balak. So, why did Jesus bring this up? You got people in your church saying it's okay to do what the pagans do. Maybe they'll be softer on us. You remember what happened to old Antipas. You remember what can happen to us. 
Let's just do some of the things that they do. It's innocent enough and we'll be accepted by the community. We'll be accepted by the pagans. We'll put on this camouflage and we'll be invisible to their criticisms, their hatreds, their attacks, their boycotts. We'll just do some of the things that they do. And herein lies the first problem. Because Jesus said, I will come and fight against them. And this is the heartbreaker for me as a pastor. Because when you keep up, as I have to do, and many of you do, with what is going on in the Western church today, there is a fake fear. I call them out. A fake fear that the church will perish from the West if we don't soften on certain more difficult points. Like, look, if you don't want to lose people, then stop talking about hell. If you want to gain people, look at where society is going. Look at the trends in society. Start teaching the doctrines of God as optional, as you can have your truth. I had said once before, and I'll use this illustration again, it's been about a year since I mentioned it, but there was a pastor that I talked with one time who, when we were talking about actually several different moral prohibitions that are definite and not open to debate, not by me, by God in the Bible, issues of homosexuality, gender, these sorts of things. The Bible simply says everybody sinned, and such were some of you. Jesus, he saves us, and he cleans us up, and he makes us his. Just says, obey me. But this guy said, but you don't understand. He said, the Bible is the inspired word of God. I said, yes, I know the Bible is the inspired word of God. But you know there was a very, very famous evangelist, and I happen to know who this guy was about 400 years ago, who said that the Bible contains the word of God. He didn't say the Bible is the word of God. He says, don't you realize that's the case with the Bible? That the Bible contains the word of God. I have news for you. If the Bible only contains the Word of God but is not the Word of God, then who is anybody to tell us which parts are the Word of God and which parts aren't? It all becomes a matter of opinion at that point, and you might as well throw the thing in the garbage or set it up on the bookshelf with all the other greats because it ain't the Word of God. It's either all or nothing. God gave us no options in that. You want to pull logic out on it, do it. Do the math. It's either all or nothing, but it doesn't work partially. When God says something is, something is. But we have to soften this because we have to be accepted by society so we can grow bigger churches or not lose the people we have. We start teaching false doctrine. We start teaching the things that God said no or teaching against the things God said yes. We're killing people nonetheless. We're slaughtering sheep because we're certainly not taking them to heaven. And that was the problem with the Pergamese. They were trying to appeal to the population around them, and the pressure was on. The pressure was bad. The pressure was, you hate us. Because you're going to allow the gods to kill us because you won't worship the gods the way we expect you to. You're going to bring us all down because you won't do what you're supposed to do in a decent society, their definition of what that was. Therefore, we'll roast you. We'll boycott you. We'll cancel you. People who hold to the doctrines of Balaam, teachings of Balaam. 
And then there are the Nicolaitans. I mentioned that before. Jesus mentions them here and he's going to do it again. He didn't like the Nicolaitans. In fact, he hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Notice he never said he hated the Nicolaitans. He loves even the most villainous people in the world. Never forget that. The most immoral, the most confused, the most backward, the most deranged, the most lost people in the world. Jesus would sit down and eat with them. That's what he did. But he doesn't have to agree with them. And he doesn't. The Nicolaitans, Nico, lord it over, conquer the laity, the people, the lower ones, the common people. This is most likely a group of people emerging in the early church out of the Gentiles. They were emerging leaders of the early church that became powerful among the people and less like servants, like the people, and more like emperors, the society that they knew and in which they lived. And I got to tell you, lording it over other people, becoming more like the emperors than the servants, compromise is the language of the powerful. One man put it like this, Compromise with worldly morality and pagan doctrine was prevalent in the church, especially in the third century when Christianity became so popular. So compromise with pagan morality and departure from biblical faith soon corrupted the church. John Walvoord, Chancellor of Dallas Theological Seminary, passed away a few years ago. What was the result? I'll tell you one church where this actually took place, and it wasn't the Church of Pergamum. It's the one we already talked about. I'm going to read you a paragraph here. It's enormously interesting. I want you to listen to this. It's the church at Ephesus. Even though Jesus didn't rebuke the Ephesians for the same thing he's rebuking the Pergamese, the same thing eventually took place in the church at Ephesus. This will stir your pot. I don't know who wrote this. I've been trying to find the author. If anybody can tell me, Please do, because I would love to be able to cite this person. They were brilliant. They said this about Ephesus. Though the introduction of the gospel was powerful and sweeping, producing radical changes in the Ephesian people and culture, over time, the church became regarded as merely another rival of Artemis. You know, that false god, the giant temple, the Artemis of the Ephesians, seven wonders of the world, that Artemis. Simply put, as the church catered and sought relevance in the culture in which it was residing, like Pergamum, like Jesus is rebuking them, both the church and the head of the church, Jesus Christ, were slowly voided of their popular transcendence. This tragic process is evidenced by a strong religio-cultural tradition, don't worry if you don't know what that meant, and doctrinal error that began to take root in Ephesus at the end of the first century. Listen, as Jesus was dying on the cross, he commissioned the apostle John to care for Mary, his mother, presumably for the remainder of her life. Legend or tradition has it that both she and John eventually moved to Ephesus, where they finally died and were buried. This tradition, listen, here it comes, triggered the genesis of the Marian cult. During the 330 years that followed, pagan celebrations continued in the city of Ephes uh, until the city of Ephesus was destroyed and the Artemis temple was severely damaged by the Goths in AD um, 262. 300 years after John's death, Ephesians finally abandoned their goddess, bowing to the 4th century edict of Theodosius I's prohibition of pagan cults. Theodosius I outlawed all the pagan cults. Some 30 years later in AD 431, don't lose me, Pope Celestine the first, the first, commissioned, first commissioned the third council of the church, the controversial council of Ephesus, as Peter Dunstan observed, he quotes this fellow, it was during this council that the legend of Mary's place of death and burial being there in Ephesus gave rise to her virtual deification and worship. It was in this city that Christianity initially 
hatched the worship of the Virgin Mary. Her elevation to sinless perfection, her titles of Mediatrix, the Mother of God, this was a deliberate ploy. Pergamum, think about it. This was a deliberate ploy to intermingle with the pagans who also revered the great mother goddess, Artemis, as both chaste virgin and matron of fertility, a bent contradiction that the neo-pagans swallowed hook, line, and sinker. Ephesus was now a destination of pilgrims arriving to adore an all too similar Christian goddess. Thus, the early, the church, the church universal, continued to accelerate away from its simple, mighty beginnings. When the gospel was the power of God unto salvation, the Christian was transcendent of the world and its system, and Jesus Christ had no rival on earth. That's the warning to Pergamum. That's why he hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. That's why he said there are some of you there that hold to the teaching of Balaam because he knew where it was going to lead. He tells the Pergamese about it, but it happened in Ephesus too. And it happened by the truckload. It's about conforming to the world in the ways that make Christians camouflaged, invisible, and if I could say irrelevant, along with the powerful message that you and I carry, Jesus loves you. Is it any wonder that Paul told the Roman church, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. You can see this in contrast to the sacrifices that they were accepting in Pergamum, in Thyatira, and in Ephesus. This is your spiritual act of worship, offering your bodies as living sacrifices. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, Paul told the Romans. These are Romans in Rome. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Repent, therefore, Jesus said, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. God help the church, churches, movements, and what have you that soften the doctrines of God in order to stay in good graces with the community that at least theologically or morally disagrees or hates what they represent. These people went to roasting in bronze bulls, as it were, because they just said, I can't do that. And yet we think we can get away with it in today's church and culture. We cannot. This is not a declaration of war against the world. It is simply saying, as we talked about last week, <coughs> this is where we stand. I will go no far, no, no farther. This is it. I stand here on the word of God. Even when I don't like some of the things the word of God says, and there are things in there that trouble me. But because God said it, that's the end of it. Well, Jesus finishes with this. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is for all the churches. To him who overcomes, win this one. Don't fall to it. Don't get defeated by it. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. What's that? We're going to find out more about that further in the book of Revelation. But let me just kind of open the door on it. I mentioned this before. Once again, here it comes. The Ark of the Covenant contained the only source of hidden manna mentioned in the Bible. We have to go back to that. Jesus isn't talking in riddles. This is a revelation, not a hiding. This is a revealing, not a book of riddles. The people here understood this. The only manna that they knew that was hidden was in a golden jar inside the Ark of the Covenant, which by this time had been missing for over 500 years. It was gone. Nobody knows where until Steven Spielberg found it. 
But the manna was in there. And the manna, of course, was the source of food for the Israelites while they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Six days out of the week, it appeared like dew on the ground. They gathered it up and they could do all kinds of wonderful things with it. At the end of their wandering in the wilderness, it stopped. But some was told Moses to collect it up, put it in a gold jar, and put it inside the Ark of the Covenant. Hide it in there. That's your hidden manna. Hidden manna. And they don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is as this was being written. I have news for you, though. It does show up later in the book of Revelation in a very, very interesting way. Again, baiting the hook for later. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The day he said that was the day after he had just fed 5,000 men plus their wives and their children over by Bethsaida on the other side of the Jordan River at the north edge of the Sea of Galilee. People showed up the following day in Capernaum when Jesus showed up there after walking on water that night, landing at Gennesaret and going back to Capernaum, and they all wanted more food. Look what he did the day before. This is a very needy society. They are hungry people, not like they can go down to the store and buy stuff. We want more food. And he says, I fed you yesterday. That's not going to last. Let me feed you forever. I'm the bread of life. Here's the key. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. But they died. This is the bread of the manna that comes down from heaven that you may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give, my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. I'm the bread of life. I'm going to give you me, eternal life, because you may lose yours here. Eventually you will, but maybe in a catastrophic way. But you know, I'm going to give you my life. I'm that hidden manna. And then finally, he said, I will also give him, whoever overcomes, a white stone with a new name on it, known only to him who receives it. There are so many questions. Get out your commentaries, do your searches online. What did a white stone mean? You're going to get a list about that long. But when you think of it, the answer is very, very simple. If these people in Pergamum refused to conform to the pagan ways of that city that you see behind me on that slide, if they refused to conform to that, then they would be boycotted. You can't buy from anybody because nobody will sell to you. You can't sell to anybody because nobody will buy from you. That means you're going to get really, really hungry because people are going to be very angry with you and they will cancel you. They're not going to deal with you. They're going to push you out. You will not be welcome in public areas. You will not be welcome in public assemblies. Your voice will not be heard anymore. <coughs> but in those days... And in Pergamum, and in that entire region of the world, the eastern Mediterranean, there were different things that white stones were used for. White stone was yes, black stone was no, voting. It's white stone. I picked this up in Pergamum, by the way. Seriously. And if you were given a white stone, you got somebody's vote. That's a good thing. But Jesus said, I'll give you a white stone. And what he also said, with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. What's that all about? They were boycotted. They were not welcome if they held to the things of Christ. And so Jesus says, I'll give you a white stone. It was also their tradition in that area and their practice that if somebody gave you a white stone with the name of the king on it. It was a free ticket to any place in the city, anywhere in that part of the world, because it was given to you by the king. 
your name on it, maybe your pet name. That's still a mystery. We don't know. I call Kathy certain things that I would never call her in front of you that are all good. They're all good. <laughs> and she calls me things that are well, all good, mostly good. Anyway, I'm just kidding. <laughs> pet names, you know. Snooky Ookums and things like that, right? <laughs> but you see, you get a stone like what Jesus is talking about. They may push you out. And they may not want to deal with you. They might not give you food. They might not give you shelter. They might not deal with you. You might starve. But I'm telling you that I give you admission to the kingdom and everything I've got for you. And there it is. It's the key to the city. My dad had a friend a long time ago who I, I never really thought about this as a kid. But when I was young, I remember the first time when I was six years old. Uh, now, forgive me, this is my, I hope this doesn't offend any of you, but my parents would go to the casinos in Lake Tahoe, South Shore. And we would go into these shows at one of these casinos in particular. I'm not going to name it because it probably wouldn't be appropriate. But I saw all kinds of people there that most of you may never have heard of, some of you younger ones, people like Red Skelton and Sammy Davis Jr. and people like this. And we would always have our table, which was a full dinner, beautiful dinner, right up against the stage. I mean, I'd lean my elbow on the stage, and I'm watching these guys do their thing up there. I mean, I'm that, that close. And it never occurred to me why. It's because my dad's best friend was best friends with the owner of the casino. And he had given him, in those days, they didn't have charge cards. They had what's called charge plates, which were little things that had embossed letters on it. And it was 14 karat gold. And when he walked into the casino, anything except chips were on the house and the best seats in the house at that. There it is. It's your white stone. Best seats in the house, admission to everything that God has in store. To follow Jesus, Oz Guinness said, is to pay the cost of discipleship and then to die to ourselves, to our own interests, to our own agendas and reputations. It is to pick up our crosses and count the cost of losing all that contradicts his will and his way, including our reputations before the world and our standing with the people in the communities that once held us dear. It is to live before one audience, it is to live before the audience of one, capital O, and therefore to die to all other conflicting opinions and assessments. A.W. Tozer said modern Christians hope to save the world by being like it, but it will never work. The church's power over the world springs from her unlikeness to it, never from her integration into it. Who knows? God forbid. Maybe there's a bronze bull waiting for us someday. How faithful will we be? Meanwhile, to the church in Greenwood, right? <laughs> How faithful are we? How faithful will we be? Then, how faithful are we today? the letter to the church at Pergamum. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for speaking to us, reminding us of that which you have put before us. Lord, we look to you to help us, Lord, to be faithful to you by the power of your spirit, for we are weak. That you would shore up in our hearts our faith in you especially when the knees of our hearts get so weak. Perhaps all we can do is fall on them and cry out to you. But in this world, Lord, you made it and it was made to be good and it's become corrupt. And yet in the midst of it, we can still walk like you, and talk like you and shine like you because of your spirit, because of your grace. And we know, Lord, that though the world may push back, that you never pushed anyone away. 
you always brought people in. You call all people to repentance, even though so many won't. But oh, how you want to save the world. Help us always to look upon others as the objects of your love, no matter what, and stand strong in you and what you say, no matter what. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.